Hello, welcome to Baltic World. My name is Chris Byrne. A more standard update today on the war in Ukraine. The other day, the city of Kherson, a city of around uh, 250,000 people in the far south of Ukraine, on the Dnieper River, just north of the Delta, fell to Russian forces. Now, this is not surprising. What is surprising is that it is the first metropolitan center to be completely overrun in Ukraine since the war began. So things are falling well behind schedule for the Russian forces. It's also believed that of the 117 battalions that had been amassing along the Ukrainian border, now all but six of them, so 111 battalions have been committed to the fight. As I said the other day, the war is now entering a new phase. Initially, the Russians restricted their combat operations, holding back much of their artillery, which is a backbone of the Russian armed forces, with a few goals in mind. Number one, to test out the defences of the Ukrainians to see how much appetite there was for spirited resistance, but also uh, to not cause too much death and destruction in the hope that they could win over the local population and be heralded as liberators. So there was a lot of piecemeal war fighting in those initial days. None of it went to Russia's plan. However, since then, Russia has massively escalated the fighting, and that was always likely. Commensurate with that is the exponential increase in the number of casualties on all sides. Accurate figures are now impossible to come by. Uh, the latest estimates I've seen is between nine and 10,000 Russian soldiers have lost their lives, and around 2,000 Russian armored vehicles, be it tanks, trucks, APCs, etc., have also been destroyed or captured or abandoned. While we would consider these to be heavy losses, and they are heavy losses, much worse than the Russian army would have prepared for, the Ukrainian side is also experiencing terrible harm, particularly the civilian population. Around 700,000 Ukrainians as of today have crossed just over the Polish border, to say nothing of the other European countries. There is artillery falling on all the major cities like rain 24 hours a day, this is a new kind of war. Moreover, the footage that I see, if you go online, you'll see columns of destroyed, burnt out vehicles, uh, funny little videos of people capturing things and making little jokes. But what you don't see are the bodies that are just strewn everywhere. Uh, overnight, there was a massive battle in Hostomol, just in the northwest area of Kiev. And although I could never put it on YouTube, the bodies, the Russian bodies, that have just piled up. It's hard to not feel, just on a human level, for the suffering being experienced on both sides. And remember, the Russian soldiers are also victims. Most of them don't know why they're there. They had no idea that they were being sent in there. And they are suffering the meat grinder of Putin's absolutely horrific and illegal war. You may have heard that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, was bombed overnight. Not a great idea. The Russian army has since seized that facility, put the fire out. As I understand it, it the fire was at a training facility, not in any of the containment facilities. But it really does go sh to show the extraordinary danger of military operations in the proximity of nuclear power plants. No doubt one of the reasons why Belarusian dictator Lukashenko built the Astrovites nuclear power plant right on the Lithuanian border. That way, if uh, there was any act of nuclear terrorism, perhaps even perpetrated by the Belarusians themselves, then the immediate consequences would be for the people of Vilnius, not for the people of Belarus. So how is the war progressing for Ukraine? Well, as of today, it's a mixed bag. As I said before, the city of Kherson has fallen to Russian forces. That is a strategically vital area. It allows Russians to cross the Dnieper River in the south of the country, bringing forces to the west. Also, it allows the Russians to resupply forces operating in the southwest of Ukraine via the Black Sea, because supply lines to that point had basically prevented a southwest approach from Kiev 
or fighting towards Lviv. It also greatly complicates any potential counterattack, which must come from the Ukrainian forces. They can't allow Kherson to remain fortified in Russian hands in perpetuity because forces on both sides can be supplied. Other issues? Well, Zelensky himself has survived three assassination attempts this week. Of course, that is good news that he survived, but those attempts are going to keep on coming, and God forbid if any of them succeed, because Zelensky himself has become an icon, a figure of resistance. The breaking of morale, should he fall in battle or, or be assassinated, is just too diabolical for the Ukrainians to think about right now. So his security, personal security, should be of paramount concern. The city of Kharkiv is starting to resemble 1940 Stalingrad. Kharkiv is going to be a humanitarian catastrophe because many of the civilians are unable to escape from that particular area. Unlike the cities closer to the west, closer to the western allies, it's the, the city of Kharkiv is all but cut off from the rest of Ukraine. There aren't many opportunities to escape. So I'm very concerned about the humanitarian crisis that's erupting in Kharkiv. The spread of famine and disease on top of the constant shelling is going to result in horrible consequences for the local people. We will need to have discourse with the Russian army to make sure that humanitarian corridors can get in there, provide food supplies, medical equipment, in order to keep the people of that city going and allow those people who wish to leave, which I'm sure will be many, to do so in a peaceable way. Other than the loss of Kherson, the biggest problem for the Ukrainian defenders right now is the lack of air power. The Russian Air Force had held back in the opening days of the conflict, actually did things that made it more vulnerable, but the Air Force has brought the full might of its bombing and fighter jets to, to bear on the battlefield, causing hell for the Ukrainian defenders from the air. The Ukrainian government has called on NATO to implement a no-fly zone, or failing that to provide the Ukrainians with fighter jets of their own to be able to contest the skies. Now, the no-fly zone is not going to happen. The risk of direct conflict between Russia and Europe will be considered too great. For those that watch my nuclear video, you'd know that the Russians, in that eventuality, would have a strong incentive to escalate to non-strategic nuclear use very early in such a conflict, it's not something that the Americans or the Europeans are going to risk. The idea of providing jets to Ukraine might seem like a good one, but it comes with two big drawbacks. One, they can only be jets from Central and Eastern Europe. In other words, MiGs and Sukhois, planes that could theoretically have made up part of the Ukrainian Air Force. If foreign fighter jets, you know, French jets, American jets are seen over the skies of Ukraine and Russians start to engage them, well, they're going to assume that these are not Ukrainian pilots, but actually Western intervention in the war in Ukraine, resulting in the same escalation. Relating to this is simply an economic issue. The cost burden of losing those jets would fall disproportionately on those countries least able to afford their replacement. The compromise is to provide far more advanced and numerous anti-aircraft weapons for the Ukrainian army to use. Obviously, Stinger missiles are flowing into Ukraine as we speak. The United States has upped its financial commitment in terms of defensive assistance from six billion US dollars to 10 billion US dollars. Biden did that as a surprise today. But it is ultimately a reality that for the duration of this war, Russia is going to enjoy air superiority and that will provide certain advantages to the Russian military that denied to the Ukrainian forces. It also means that the character of the war is going to be far more bloody and horrific because most of the fighting necessarily must take place in urban areas where the defenders can mitigate the impact of Russia's air superiority. All that said, there are definitely positives. At this stage of the conflict, it's astonishing that so much of the country remains in Ukrainian hands. The degree of uh, uniformity, camaraderie and support provided by the Europeans and the Americans to Ukrainian forces is unparalleled. I've never seen such commitment ever in my lifetime. The Russian economy is being totally destroyed. Not only is the cutting off of the SWIFT payment system causing havoc, but the sanctions are biting. The various international payment systems, such as Google Pay, has stopped working in Russia, creating total havoc. And then the Russian market, you know, the market stock exchange has been closed ever since the war began, isn't planned to be open till at least Tuesday. They continuously delay 
the inevitable, what will happen is the total collapse of the Russian stock market, at least 35% in a single day. Of course, the ruble is now worth nothing. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians are benefiting from a constant funneling in of money from the international community, people providing all kinds of support, both financial and in-kind, to keep the Ukrainian people going. On the flip side, I've had some important discussions this week with people on the ground who know a lot about this stuff. They don't believe that sanctions are going to result in the fall of the Putin regime, nor do they believe that the numbers of casualties that are racking up in Ukraine are going to change things either. Instead, the Russian people are being currently force-fed a huge amount of propaganda that Mother Russia is under threat and under siege from Western forces that want to bring it down. Also, the Russian government has implemented new totalitarian measures, making it a crime to encourage people to go out and engage in anti-war protests or to publish so-called misinformation, i.e. anything that the Russian government doesn't approve of, the penalties are incredibly severe, five and 10 years respectively. So right now we're in the darkest phase of this war. There is a high-end, high-intensity, high-casualty conflict raging all across Ukraine. Ukraine's defense has been valiant and stout and achieved more and done more than anyone could have thought possible. It is still holding out well, all things considered, certainly much greater than anyone could have anticipated. However, Russia is throwing everything at this now. But to finish this video on a bit of a high note, we should remember that even if the Russian army were somehow to win the battle of Ukraine, well, the war, the strategic war, Russia versus the West, is now lost. Finland, Sweden, they're highly likely to join NATO. Many European countries have approved Ukraine's accession to the European Union. Military forces are pouring into Eastern NATO, which will militarize that position. Russia's economy is completely collapsing. It's going to depend on foreign aid in order to survive. So the whole Russian strategic situation has fallen because of Putin's misadventure. And we can only continue to raise the costs and risk for Russia in pursuing this further. That's my view. Please leave your thoughts down below. I will, of course, keep you updated as much as developments arise. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.